Yes. Uh, Linda Hirschman, in a book I think is called Back to Work, laments about very highly educated women opting out of the workforce and, and uh, concludes that there won't be too many women to put on the bench to be Chief Justices. I'd like to hear your comments on that. I, I simply want to reiterate what Judith said, which is um, I think um, it is um, both the obligation and the opportunity for um, all of us who are um, interested in keeping um, everybody in the society, in you know, fully representative people in positions uh, of responsibility, which is very time consuming, but we simply have to try to crack uh, what is variously called the balance of work and family and so on and so forth. Now, um, I, I am very optimistic about that because I have a sense of history. Um, we have the vote. We get admitted to law schools, we can be educated, and I have no doubt that collectively we can solve the problem. There are so many ways um, that it can be tackled. And if it's a question of, you know, eight, 80 hours at work or you don't proceed, you don't succeed, you don't move up the ladder, that is entirely inconsistent with family responsibilities. Um, I don't know about any of you, and I go off to northern Italy for vacations. Now, northern Italy has an absolutely booming economy, and somebody once told me they had more Lear jets per population than we have in the United States, and they take an hour and a half for lunch, and they leave at 6 in the evening. I mean, I think we're nuts in the United States with the way we do um, sort of endless kinds of work. There are solutions, and I simply think we have to put our best minds and dedication to it and not take it granted. Um, I, I agree, and let me just add, I heard 20 years ago, I think, Patricia Wald, former Chief Judge of, of the D.C. Circuit, speak at a, a women judges, uh, a, on a, at a women judges luncheon, and she said, you know, we have, we, we've been given our tickets of admission to the ballpark. This is talking about women lawyers and women judges. She said, we're, we're in the game the question remains whether we will change the rules, uh, referring to the way the game is played, the way law is practiced, the way the profession conducts itself. And as Judith alluded to, there, there is a lot of uh, basis for concern that in that ensuing 20 years, the economics of law practice is such that uh, women, many women and men too who care about family commitments are taking them at themselves out of uh, certain aspects of the practice of law, which isn't to say that there aren't many other opportunities in the law, but I wonder about the extent to which we have put the need to change the rules on the national agenda sufficiently. I see signs that it's getting on the agenda, but it's been a long time coming. Anyone else want to add to that? Really tough question. There are just too many women, especially women, leaving the practice of law which I think is just devastating. I'm so sad to see that. that uh, and I think we all need to put our heads together and find ways uh, to stop this. It, it's, it's in the interest of everyone, for all of society, that we find the answers, and we just haven't found the answers. Yes. You mentioned earlier that you only I believe each of you could only think of a few instances in which your gender influenced the outcome of your decision. I'm wondering if you can think of any times when you reached the same outcome as the men on the court, but because of your experience as women or your gender, you reached it by different reasoning. And along the same lines, I wonder whether your gender or your experience as a woman has ever affected your decision whether to publish either a concurring or a dissenting opinion? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question in the sense that one of the questions I didn't get to ask was about the issue of consensus. And you've all seen the press recently, Chief Justice Roberts coming out very strongly for consensus. And uh, you know the old maxim that today's dissent is tomorrow's majority, so if we only have consensus, what will happen? Who would like to respond? 
Well, I think it's only the academics who say today's dissent is tomorrow's <laughs> act. It's the academics. I mean, if we play to the press that way, they, we'd have more dissents, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as the chief judge, um, I agree completely with Chief Justice Roberts that uh, it is very desirable uh, to build consensus and for the high court to articulate the principle of law as clearly uh, and coherently um, as possible and not to sow the seeds of, of dissension. Um, but as to the particular question uh, that was asked, uh, I'm very interested. I think, I don't know whether it was Shirley or Christine who mentioned the social scientists, I guess uh, Christine. Um, and, and this is one where uh, I don't feel comfortable um, uh, judging my own work um, as, uh, as whether I've, I've expressed a view as a woman or uh, a view as a daughter of immigrants or whatever. Um, I, I think the social scientists, the, I think we need a more objective view here than, than certainly that I could express as to my own work. Could I offer dissenting view on the no, first point? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking of a recent case in which our court has decided uh, a question of of statutory interpretation that was that was very open. I mean, there was an enormous ambiguity in the statute, and uh, a member of our court would have been me uh, viewed the statute differently and believed that the majority had it wrong in terms of what the legislature intended. And I thought it was important to publish that dissent in order to contribute to the discussion, which I hoped would happen with the legislature, which is a function that particularly in state courts, and I'm not speaking to the function of the United States Supreme Court, which is of a different order, but in state courts, we are in constant dialogue with the other branches of government. And sometimes a dissenting opinion can illuminate uh, policy issues that, that I think are important to put into the, into the public discussion. So it's not that I disagree with the notion of consensus, but I do think that uh, dissent has its place, particularly in state courts where this dialogue is ongoing. Well, I, as to the first part of that question, I think it's very difficult to uh, separate the various uh, threads of your life, gender, age, background, education, practice. So. I'd have a hard time saying what part of my life and life's experiences and my views, which are very deeply shaped by my law school training and practice, uh, affected anything. Now, if everybody would just agree with me, we wouldn't have these dissents and concurring opinions. <laughs> but unfortunately, they don't. And so sometimes I'm in a unanimous court, and sometimes I'm in the majority, and other times I write a concurring or dissenting opinion. And I will write a dissenting and concurring opinion if I think I can add something to the law, because opinions are the beginning of a dialogue a dialogue with your colleagues on the bench, a dialogue with the lawyers, not only who appear before you, but the rest of the bar, a dialogue with the academy, a dialogue with my fellow and sister judges across the state. And the minority opinion may be the basis some years or maybe some months hence for a further discussion about this issue when it arises in a different case. Uh, also, a minority opinion on one state court may persuade a judge of another state court to take that on as the majority there. And what you've done is you've um, saved that other judge a lot of time and effort, <laughs> which you have already put in, and then they can build on that, and then you build on them. So I think there are um, many cases where um, a unanimous court may be very important for the development of the law and that uh, generally it's good to have a uh, unanimous court and consensus, but the dissenting and concurring opinions play a very important role in the development of the law. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, I'm a first year student at law school, actually Justice Marshall's alma mater, and it's been my experience and my friends' experience that women still experience law school very differently than the men. We speak far less in class, we're not as well represented on the journals, we don't form relationships with professors in the same way, and I was wondering if any of you had any advice for women law students about these issues or just in general. Oh, I have, I have plenty of advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think you're pointing to a phenomenon which is uh, familiar to professors and students, and uh, there are good reasons for it and bad reasons for it. I think one of the um, um, uh, one of the most illuminating uh, uh, comments that I heard recently was that a uh, one of the professors at Yale Law School asks people who do not wish to answer the question to raise their hands. <laughs> and in, instead of saying, you know, if you want to be called on, uh, raise your hand. If you do not want to be called on, please raise your hand. And in doing that, it was uh, his observation that he had a very different set of students uh, from whom he could select uh, to um, to answer questions. Um, I was struck when I was a partner in a law firm uh, how many times young men associates came to ask my advice. Uh, they were sometimes in the trial court department, they're often in the tax department or the you know, securities department or the something else department and they would come in at sort of five o'clock and say, you know, Margie if they knew me well enough or Miss Marshall if they didn't. I wonder if I could ask you about, and sometimes the questions were absolutely dreamed up questions, I was quite sure, but it was an opportunity to come and talk to me, and I was struck by how few women did that. Um, I think, you know, perhaps one of the most important pieces of advice that I can give to young um, professionals, men and women, but I ask women to listen, is to seek out mentors. Um, all of us, I suspect, if we went down the list, Christine and Shirley and Judith, and certainly I had mentors, and they're not only mentors of the same gender, quite the contrary. Uh, some of my greatest mentors, in fact, my greatest mentors were all men, and not surprising, because there weren't very many uh, women in positions of authority who could act as a mentor to me. I think they skills that you have to learn. You're not born with them. Um, and I, I think Judith, um, I love Judith's comment, um, and it is actually one of the things that I talk about sometimes. I have a little talk, Marshall's 10 Tips to Success. I'm not going to give you all 10 tonight, but one of them is uh, not to be afraid to be ambitious. Now, <laughs> ambition is an interesting thing. I, as I said at the beginning, I never thought I would be a justice, but I knew that I wanted to be very good at whatever I did. And one way to be very good at whatever you do is to figure out who's very good in whatever situation you are in. So if you are in a major law firm, and Mike Cooper, I happen to see Mike sitting down here, is the president of the Association of the Bar of New York, City of New York, and is a lane maker and a national guru on this, for heaven's sake, just watch him. Figure out what he does. Um, I mean, how does he do it? And go and ask him, is this a thing to do or shouldn't I do it? And, I mean, there are just so many ways we can learn. Um, so I think it's a combination of um, wanting to be the very best you can and also, which I think you've heard over and over and over again on this panel this evening, don't think you have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Uh, other people have done it uh, before you. And for heaven's sake, I mean, I was so pleased this evening that we have women asking questions because I hate to go to meet, you know, any kind of public talk, and it happens to me over and over and over and over again that the first 20 questions come from men. Um, and I just wait until a woman asks a question, and they'll say, any more questions? And I say, no, I'd like one more question, and then I'd like one more question, and then I'd like one more question. And sometimes then I'm until 11 o'clock at night, and I'm not going to ask until one woman gets up and asks the question, then I'll finish the questions. I, I suspect it's the case that, that none of us, and probably none of you in this room, got where you are by staying in your comfort zone. And I, I was one of those women law students who didn't realize that it was a good thing to get to know faculty outside of class or to approach other people for advice and so on. And it's not that I really learned to keep my mouth shut. That, that I 
was a foregone conclusion after college, but you, you really have to push yourself out of your comfort zone and watch, watch the students that you think are getting more out of their educational experience and do what they do. Uh, sometimes it doesn't come as easily to one person as to another, and um, I suspect that, that women may have been socialized to a greater degree even now in the 21st century to stay in their comfort zones more often. Uh, but it, it just doesn't get you very many places that you really want to go. Yes, I, I, I have, is, is I have two questions. I was wondering whether during your very successful legal careers you, got, you have encountered situations in which you've been labeled under one of very, two very common stereotypes, either of a woman being too aggressive Pushy broad, I think, would be the term, <laughs> yes. Um, or of being a pushover, um, and how have you dealt with it? And my second question is whether there are times when, either by choice or due to pressure, you choose to perhaps stand down um, when there's something that you believe in, but you decide to stand down due to your gender because perhaps society isn't ready for such a decision or you thought that strategically for some reason it would be, it would be best to do so. Well, I'll take the first part because I just remember in discovery once uh, in a large litigation finding out that my adversary referred to me by the initials DL, which I learned was Dragon Lady. <laughs> and I felt proud. <laughs> I always thought when I was in practice that if the lawyer on the other side uh, started commenting on my uh, gender or making me worry about being aggressive or domineering or something, that he had a lousy case. <laughs> <laughs> and that if he had to resort to that, I was in the saddle and in the driver's seat and just stay calm, keep focused, don't let them distract you or detour you, and you just stay on that case. And just, whatever it is, that happened to be in litigation, but it could be anywhere. You are the winner when it gets to that because that is the, the best argument the guy can make. And if that's the best, he's a loser. So you can't worry about that. Not everybody is going to like you all the time. I'm sorry to tell you that. I mean, I'm an exception to that rule. <laughs> but, you know, the rest of you just have to put up with that and do what you think is right and have the concept that you've got the compass and follow it. And uh, you will do fine. And don't worry about that. It's, uh, I think that sometimes, I think it's easier uh, when you were the only woman or one of a few. You just had no choice but to go in there and sit it out and take it and go. Because otherwise you had to go home and curl up in a fetal position and never leave the house. Because <laughs> you had no other choices. So even with a critical mass, whether you're in a law firm or in law school, things haven't changed that much, but life, no one said life was going to be easy for you. Then I have, two, I, have, I have two quick anecdotes. I was uh, going to Germany to give a speech and the uh, administrator of the institute that had asked me to come and talk um, sent an email to my wonderful assistant, which read literally as follows, I've just Googled Chief Justice Marshall, does anybody ever say anything nice about her? <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is, um, we haven't talked a lot about influences of mothers, and I want you to listen to the whole nursery rhyme. My mother taught me the following nursery rhyme. There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was wonderful. <laughs> now, there was someone, yes. Um, 
I have one question. Um, as Chief uh, Administrator of Justice in your states, what reform effort are you engaged in now that you haven't succeeded in yet that is dear to your heart and why? And what kind of obstacles are you facing to achieve it? I Who think uh, Lynn Shafflin said this was being taped on C-SPAN, oh. <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to admit to anybody what reforms I'm undertaking that I haven't succeeded in. <laughs> All I can say is I testified before the Joint Committee on the House Ways and Means today, and I know I'm going to get that budget that I asked for. <laughs> Judge Kay, you want to offer anything? Well, uh, I would say as a general answer, uh, that it would be a terrible mistake for any of us uh, to declare that any reform we really cared about had succeeded. Um, it's always a work in progress. Uh, habits, old habits die hard, and if you don't watch all the time, even something you think you've absolutely put in place um, goes, back, um, goes back to its very beginnings. Um, we're uh, battling right now in the state of New York uh, for salary increases. I hope in a couple of months to tell you that is one where we have succeeded 100 percent in every aspect of, uh, of the reform because the judges of this state um, so richly deserve it. Um, what we are, was somebody applauding that? Uh, <laughs> But I say that I stay, I stay with my general proposition, I, I, which is um, uh, inf that never to declare something finished and walk away from it, point one. Point two, always be optimistic that you will succeed. You know, I, I just thought of a wonderful example of something that, that is underway, which is meeting with uh, obstacles. And uh, I'm not going to say a word about it, just in case somebody in Utah watches C-SPAN. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody. <laughs> I uh, agree, uh, of course, with all the speakers, but especially Judith, who said uh, everything we do is a work in progress. And just when you think you've got it where it's really going well, life changes, courts change, society change, and you have to uh, keep working at it. So. Uh, you just can't take your eyes off any of these and just keep moving on all of them as best we all can. I just want to quote something from Judge Kay. Um, this was with respect to the work of the task forces on gender bias in the court. She came last April to speak at the 20th anniversary of the committee charged with implementing the recommendations in New York. And she used a phrase that I have quoted constantly ever since because I think it applies to our work in so many respects, and it's certainly a good phrase for the question that was just asked. Impressive progress alongside persistent problems. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have a question just in follow-up to Judge Kay's challenge to younger women in, in reforming and changing the quality of life, work-life balance in, in law firms specifically. I just pose to you, each of you, as um, employers and as former women in our, our positions of being young um, associates and um, lawyers in the field, what you have learned from your experience that you would maybe do differently or what you're doing in your courts as employers. I know as a native of Utah, Justice uh, Durham has fantastic reputation um, as an employer of women and mothers specifically. So I'm just wondering what kind of advice from those two perspectives you might have to pass along to um, the younger generation. Well, why don't we start with Justice Durham so well, we can Babies find out in what chambers are great for the blood pressure. <laughs> well, and, and you're right, as employers, as, manage, as women as managing partners of law firms who are outsourcing legal work, uh, you, you really can have an impact by making uh, accommodations in your own practices, by insisting on diversity in the people that you, and firms and entities that you hire and <coughs> supervise. Uh, one of the things that, that concerns me greatly is, I mentioned before the economics of law practice. I really think we've got to do something about the billable hour. I think the billable hour has transformed. 
I thought so, <laughs> has transformed the practice of law in some very malignant ways. And uh, th there are some efforts out there. there. There's at least one major law firm uh, originating in the Midwest that's, that is focusing on a new form of law firm economics and management, trying to do away with billable hours, uh, transforming relationships with clients, and so on. And I, th I think it's time for us to demand more research and more effort uh, on the part, and I'm talking to all of you who are in the practice. I, judges, we could do our part. Uh, one of my favorite stories of all time goes back to when I was a trial judge and a, a lawyer, I was trying a four month long cons big construction case and one of the lawyers stood up one afternoon, we'd let the jury go home and it was about 5, 5.30 and one of the lawyers stood up and, and I knew him, he was married to a friend of mine who's also a lawyer. He said, Judge, it's my night to pick up the children. Is there any chance we could recess? I said, of course we could recess. And I stopped for it. Now, I don't know whether he would have had the nerve to ask a male judge that question or whether a male judge would have responded, but more judges need to, uh, need to account for the needs of litigators in their courts. And you've just reminded me of an experience, uh, a, a really critical experience in my own life when I was uh, uh, litigating um, uh, in a firm in, in Manhattan and uh, was sent um, to a case in Jacksonville, Florida, which was a really interesting case and I was so pleased to have been sent there. But I had three children, the eldest uh, was three and a half years old. Um, and every um, Friday uh, night my husband and the children would come pick me up at the airport and every Sunday afternoon they would take me um, out to the airport to go back to Jacksonville, Florida. This went on for several months. Um, and one day I simply submitted my resignation to the firm. And they were just so startled. They said, we thought everything was great. We thought you were really enjoying this. I said, I know, but I have three children under the age of four at home, and this is devastating. And they said, oh, my goodness. It never occurred to us that this was a problem for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I guess uh, Christine started a sentence that was be more demanding. I would put a period there. Be bold, I would put a period there. Um, and I, I think we've achieved um, a, a, a point in, our, uh, in, in society, in the workforce, um, in the, where we can be more bold and more demanding and can assume uh, a better response uh, than in an earlier day when there were just one or two of us there. Uh, I, I, I think that the employers, such as the experience that Christine has just uh, described, uh, are trying to be responsive and would like to be. In our court, we have a job sharing. So if uh, men or women uh, want uh, to uh, work only part time, uh, they can. It's very difficult to do good job sharing, but uh, it can be done and is done. We also have opportunities for uh, part-time work. And uh, I also um, think that depends on the individuals and their circumstances. Uh, but uh, I think we should uh, view people coming in and out of the job market uh, very well. And that uh, women who decide, or men, but women who decide that they want to take several years off and be uh, full-time homemakers uh, should, uh, we all should recognize the uh, value of uh, the homemaker and how difficult a job that is. I mean, one reason I didn't do it is because it was too tough for me. And I'm serious. I'm really serious. And um, I hire people who have been out of the job market and have been homemakers because they can multitask. Nothing phases them. They can talk on the phone, listen to everybody else in the office scream, and do a whole multitude of things because they have learned to do that as homemakers. And they know how to budget their time and make the most out of a, out of a minute. And I think we have to recognize uh, the values that people learn in a whole life experiences, including homemakers. So although 
I'm always sorry to see a woman who has been well trained in the law uh, leave the law. I do not view that as a total loss to the law or to uh, women professionals because uh, she's doing something very important at, at home and she's going to come back and she's going to be better trained to do that. So um, I think we have to open up the job market to people who want a variety of different jobs and uh, make them comfortable in doing that, but also open the job market to people who <coughs> leave for a while. Well, it is now 9 o'clock, and even though I'm sure that we want to hear more from this fantastic panel, uh, we are going to call the evening to a close. When we began, Justice Ginsburg said that she came to this evening as a spirit-lifting event uh, before she went on to some very difficult writing and wrangling, shall we say. I think this has been a spirit-lifting event for all of us. It is just so phenomenal to know the kind of wonderful talent and commitment to justice and all the things that I think all of us hold near and dear that these four women exemplify. So Justice Ginsburg, we thank you for letting us honor you and for being the occasion of this wonderful evening, and we thank all of you for coming. Good night. Thank you.